I think everyone has officially made it in from the waiting room so we can get our program started. I would like to introduce Carolyn Schreier, who's going to kick us off um, with, by introducing our amazing speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Schreier. I am on the advisory committee for Hillel at Rhodes College. Uh, thank you for joining us today <laughs> on One Foot Faculty Lecture Series. It features a different faculty member from the University of Memphis or Rhodes College every other week so we can spotlight the incredible intellectual talent here in Memphis. And it's for the entire Memphis Jewish community to enjoy. Uh, this week's speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Jackson. He's the professor of history at Rhodes College. He'll be discussing his recent book, Paper Bullets. Dr. Jackson received his BS in history summa cum laude from, with high honors from Vanderbilt University in 1993 and a PhD in history from the University of Rochester in 1999. At Rhodes College, he teaches courses in modern European history cultural history, French history, your uh, environmental studies, and interdisciplinary humanities. In 2011, Dr. Jackson won the prestigious Clarence Day Award for Outstanding Research, uh, Rhodes College highest honor for faculty. So we welcome you, Dr. Jackson, and we're excited to learn from you. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the wonderful introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Uh, to hear a little bit more about uh, my book, Paper Bullets. Um, I'm coming to you from my home here in Memphis, and I wish we could all be together in person. It's always nice when we can be, but these days, um, since we can't, uh, through the magic of the internet, more of us maybe can even be together than we could under normal circumstances. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to tune in. Um, it really is a great honor and a great delight to be part of an event that's organized by the Hillels of Memphis. And part of this wonderful speaker series, <clears throat> and I'm really honored to be, uh, to be included. Um, some of you may know some of my earlier work. I don't know, um, if some of you may have heard me speak before here in town. Um, most of my work previously has been about uh, France and French history and French culture. Uh, I wrote a book about the disastrous, sometimes forgotten Paris flood of 1910. Um, that book was called Paris Underwater. And I wrote a book called Making Jazz French um, about the reception of jazz music in Paris in the 1920s and the 1930s and how jazz became part of re a regular part of the French cultural scene. Um, but for about the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a powerful story about resistance and perseverance in the face of grave danger by two French artists. Um, and that forms the heart of this, of this new book, Paper Bullets. And I'll also read some selected excerpts from the book um, just to give you a sense of how I tell the story. And I've lightly edited those excerpts today just for clarity. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint to, to share with you um, with some great images. Can you see that okay? Sophie, give me a thumbs up if you can see that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and I wanna say a special thanks as well um, before I start to, to my friends at Novel Books here in Memphis. Um, I'm sure many of you know Novel. Um, selling uh, signed copies of Paper Bullets. And so if you're interested, um, you can order uh, through them, go to their website or call them, uh, and you can request the signed copy. And I'm also happy to, to go out, to drive out and personalize it for you if you want. I've done that numerous times now. Um, so you just let the folks at Novel know, um, and I'll be happy to, to personalize it. Of course, you can buy the book from many places, uh, both uh, in person and online, including Apple Books, where it was named the best book for November 2020. But it's always great to uh, help support a local independent bookseller uh, like Novel. Well, um, and let me also just finally one more time, just remind everybody, if you don't mind, to make sure that you're on mute so that you can hear, uh, make sure to hear everything. <clears throat> um, and then we'll, we'll have some questions at the end. All right, well, I wanna introduce you, um, let me get my slide to work, here we go. Um, I wanna introduce you to two very remarkable women. Um, and if you know something about the history of art, and especially the history of photography, then you may have heard of them before. But even if you know their work, you may not know much about the story of how and why they fought the Nazis for four years. Their story has really inspired me and many other people that I've talked to uh, over the years about it. I'm really glad to be able to share it with you today. So I'd like you to meet Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Mahler, two of the most unlikely Nazi fighters that most of you probably have never heard of. They were Parisian artists. Lucy was a writer and Suzanne was an illustrator who had studied in art school before uh, when she was young. Um, together, the two of them collaborated on what people in their own day saw as some sometimes shocking photography. 
They were friends with and influenced by many of the great modern artists of Paris in their day, Picasso, André Breton, Salvador Dali, Jean Cocteau, but many of their images turned the ideas of gender and identity on their heads. And more than anything, that's what they're known for today. And if you do know them, um, you know them by some different names. And I'll say more about their names in just a second. But after they left Paris and they left the art world behind, they put their skills as artists to work fighting against the German army on the Channel Island uh, of Jersey, the island of Jersey, which is one of the Channel Islands uh, in the British Channel, in the English Channel. They used their creative powers to get inside the heads of the soldiers. And in brief, here's how it worked. Lucy and Suzanne created a PSYOPs campaign, a psychological operations campaign that was designed to demoralize the soldiers by telling them that the war was a lost cause and trying to convince them to go home to their families. And they did it in a very unexpected way with notes and messages and stories, of BBC news reports and drawings, songs, body jokes and provocative slogans on, on little slips of paper like the one that you see on your screen. And they left all of these notes around the island for the Germans to find. In some cases, they even put the notes directly into the pockets of the soldiers themselves. And so I want to read the first excerpt from the book, um, the opening scene of the book, that gives you a sense of how they went about this incredible project. On the morning of July 25th, 1944, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Maleb went into saint Helier to do some shopping. The trip was part of the regular routine. Outside the offices of the Jersey Evening Post, they glanced up at the large clock at the top of the building. Suzanne leaned in and whispered to Lucy to keep watch. Then Suzanne scanned the long row of police cars the Nazi occupation forces always parked along Charles Street, a reminder of how heavily the Germans censored the island's only newspaper. Suzanne took a small piece of paper out of her pocket and began moving carefully toward one of the police cars as Lucy stood by on lookout duty. Suzanne stuck the gummed paper on the windshield. It read, the cowardly bureaucrats of the police who live on lies and shameful cruelty will be destroyed by the soldiers with no names. No one seemed to be paying any attention to the middle-aged women in Burberry trench coats with bright scarves tied around their heads. Suzanne quickly attached a few papers to a few more windshields and casually strolled away, her Wellington boots thumping on the pavement. If anyone asked the women what they were doing, their shopping bag would provide a ready alibi. After finishing their secret mission, along with some mundane errands, they met up with their housekeeper, Edna, and boarded one of the wood-burning buses to head back home on the other side of the island. Lucy held a package of cigarette papers they had just bought at the newsstand. These papers were destined to become a new batch of notes for the Nazis. In her pocket, alongside more of their notes, Suzanne could feel the bright blue milk of magnesia bottle. It did not contain the digestive medicine, however, but instead an overdose of the powerful barbiturate Gardenol in case the Germans caught them in the act. With no warning, the bus came to an abrupt halt and a fair-haired soldier climbed aboard, everyone off the bus. Lucy clutched her parcel a bit tighter. Outside, the soldier approached each commuter. Suzanne noticed his bright blue eyes. Please show me your papers. How old are you? What is your occupation? Where were you born? Where do you live? How many children do you have? With his critical eye, the German carefully looked over each passenger's documents until satisfied, saying very little other than what was necessary to get his answers. If something was suspicious or if passengers had forgotten their documents, they were told, someone will visit you in your home. Then the soldier approached Lucy and Suzanne. <clears throat> Lucy recalled the scene several years later in a scrapbook of notes that might have formed the basis of a memoir if she had lived long enough. She titled these reminiscences, The Mute in the Middle of the Muddle. Show me your registration card, the German demanded. He stood in front of Lucy, glaring at her. A look of recognition crossed his face when he saw a familiar name, Schwab. What kind of name is that? The document listed French as her national origin. She explained nervously that she was an orphan and raised by a Frenchman. Perhaps you are Alsatian. Maybe, she replied, but admitted that she didn't really know. Lucy stated that she had been on Jersey for some 30 years. Nearly everything she had just told the German about herself was a calculated lie. She invented a new backstory for herself, and not for the first time. <clears throat> As the minutes ticked by, Lucy waited patiently next to the bus and watched the soldiers scrutinize her documents. Suzanne and Edna were close by, but could do nothing to help. Lucy, perhaps coughing or stumbling a bit, 
played sick for the Germans' benefit, brushing off her acting skills from her Paris days when she took part in avant-garde theater productions. Finally, the soldier handed back Lucy's papers. When he wrapped up his examination of all the passengers, everyone reboarded the bus. An acquaintance riding with them tried to break the nervous tension created by the ordeal. They have not caught you this time, she said, laughing, unaware of what Lucy's parcel of cigarette papers was destined for. Now, I'll tell you more about how they did all of these things in just a moment, but first I wanna tell you a little bit about their background. We have to go back in time a little bit. Um, because one of the questions that I had to think about was why would two women with so much to lose put their lives on the line in the way that they did? And I also had to think about the question of, um, of what was it about who they were that gave them the strength and the power to become resistors? Because after all, most people did not become resistors during World War II. I think part of the answer to those questions lies in their personal histories. Lucy and Suzanne grew up around the turn of the 20th century in the southern French city of Nantes as daughters of wealth and privilege. Lucy's father was a newspaper owner and editor, and Suzanne's was the head of the medical school and a well-known physician. So they were never starving artists, even when they moved to Paris as young women in the 1920s, uh, in their 20s, just after World War I, to pursue their artistic careers because they always had family resources that they could draw on. In fact, I think one reason they did not become famous in their own day, even in the art world, is that they never really needed to publicize their work in order to make money. Now, they were known in certain circles, such as among the surrealists with whom they were friends, but for decades they were largely forgotten until being rediscovered in the 1980s. Yet to become resistors, they would need to give up the privilege and the comfort that they were born with. But why would they? Well, there are some key things about their life stories which, although they didn't know it at the time, would set the stage for their resistance against the Nazis. First of all, Lucy's father's family was Jewish. And he was assimilated and didn't practice the faith. Um, but Lucy embraced elements of her Jewish identity that were taught to her by her grandmother. There were also several rabbis and, and scholars of Jewish life that were in the family. Lucy was four years old at the height of one of the worst anti-Semitic episodes in modern French history, the Dreyfus Affair. Now that's a complicated story and we don't have time to go into it here today, but it led to crowds outside the family's apartment building shouting down with the Jews. And later when Lucy was 12, she was attacked by other children in school who pelted her with rocks and anti-Semitic taunts while she lay helpless on the playground. So Lucy and Suzanne would both would remember those horrible days and the memory would fuel their hatred of fascism and their willingness to fight against it. A second factor that's uh, important uh, that allowed them to become resistors was the fact that they were in love. Lucy and Suzanne had met as young girls in the elite circles of Nantes society and played together from childhood. By the time they were teenagers, they began a relationship that was in tension with a conservative French Catholic society that valued respectability. Most people in France at the turn of the century did not see a lesbian couple as respectable. Their connection was made even more complicated by the fact that in 1917, Lucy's divorced father married Suzanne's widowed mother, making the girls stepsisters as well. But their feelings were powerful, and Lucy wrote in a thinly veiled, wrote a thinly veiled article published in a Nantes-based literary journal that her feelings for her Suzanne were her idée maîtresse, as she put it, her main idea and her guiding principle. She wrote, I am in her, she is in me, and I will follow her always, never losing sight of her. And if you look at this image that's on the right-hand side of your screen, one that Lucy drew, you see their initials at the top, LS, Lucy Schwab, and SM, Suzanne Malaire, but they're all squished together, so it's the three letters LSM sharing that middle initial S. Um, and if you read that, those three letters phonetically in French, El Sem, it creates the sentence El Sem, which in French means they love each other. Now, drawing on their own experiences, Lucy and Suzanne also explore gender and sexuality as fluid and changing categories. This is one of the things that they're most famous for today. Uh, in fact, as I said before, they're not known in the art world as Lucy and Suzanne, but rather by the gender neutral artistic names which they took, Claude Cahan and Marcel Moore. And although her name is Claude Cahan, it's pronounced in French Cahan. Most people in English tend to pronounce it Claude Cahun. I'll probably say Claude Cahun for the rest of this presentation, just for clarity. So Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore were these gender neutral names that they took. 
And they assume these names to create new identities, but also to cross gender lines. Claude in particular is a name that's used by both men and women in French. Cahoon put it this way in a memoir that she published in 1930. She wrote, masculine, feminine, it depends on the situation. Neuter is the only gender that always suits me. If it existed in our language, no one would be able to see my thoughts vacillation. So gender was for Cahoon situational, conditional, fluid, depending on the moment. But Lucy's new name also allowed her to express her Jewishness. In fact, I think it was as much about Jewishness um, as it was about gender, because Cahoon was the name of one set of Lucy's grandparents, in particular, the grandmother who had taught her about Judaism. And Cahoon is also the French version of Cohen, the Hebrew word for priest. So like many other artists of their day, they created work under new names, but these identities also allowed the women to slip the trap of traditional bourgeois society. Yet throughout their lives, they always still called one another Lucy and Suzanne. And the historical documents are very clear on that point. We tend to call them now, and if you look them up on the internet, you'll find them under the names Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore. And we know them, we call them that typically um, in scholarship because we know them through their art. Um, but when you look at the documents as I've done and you look at how they refer to one another, you realize they called each other Lucy and Suzanne. And then those are the names on their tombstone. So if you've seen their work under the names Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore, you know the ways in which their photographs depict Cahoon, Lucy, in gender ambiguous dress or pose, playing with notions of masculinity and femininity, in some ways helping to invent the notion of what we would now call queerness, long before our current understanding of that idea was created. In fact, many queer and transgender people today see them as early heroes and role models. The photos deconstructed gender categories, showing them to be masquerade and performance, decades before scholars would take up those questions. Cahoon put it this way in her autobiography. He wrote, I shave my head, wrench out my teeth, my breasts, anything that is embarrassing or annoying to look at, stomach, ovaries, the brain, conscious and covered in cysts, suggesting that altering gender and sexual identity was part of the goal, and so was creating a new sense of self. The musician David Bowie, well known for his own gender ambiguity, mentioned a 2007 show of Cahoon and Moore's photography on his blog. I find this work really quite mad in the nicest way, Bowie wrote. Now that ability to cross gender lines would also become crucial in Lucy and Suzanne's fight against the Nazis. So keep that in mind um, as I keep talking. Lucy and Suzanne spent the 1920s and most of the 1930s in Paris, but they decamped to the island of Jersey, one of the Channel Islands, in 1937, when they were both in their late 40s. They had vacationed on Jersey many times over the years, so its beaches and its natural beauty were very familiar to them. And I'll just say on a personal note, I visited Jersey as part of the research uh, for this book, and I can totally understand why they would want to move there. It's a beautiful place, um, a lovely island, uh, very peaceful, um, and lots of beautiful sights and vistas. Um, it was also a perfect respite for Lucy's chronic ill health. She had a number of medical conditions through which Suzanne had helped to nurse her over the years. And Paris had become deeply politically polarized by the 1930s with various groups literally fighting in the streets. And with fascism on the rise across Europe, Jersey offered a peaceful escape. And when they left Paris and they left the art world behind, they stopped using those names Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore and returned almost exclusively to their birth names, Lucy and Suzanne, and that's part of why I refer to them in the book as Lucy and Suzanne, is because I'm primarily interested in their post-Paris years. Little did they know, though, that when they moved to Jersey, they were stepping into what would soon become a war zone. When the fighting broke out in Poland in 1939, Jersey seemed far away from the action. But by 1940, the Channel Islands would become the front lines. The islands were the only piece of British soil the Nazis conquered and they were crucial to what Hitler called his Atlantic Wall, a line of defense in the West that was designed to keep the Allies at bay. Thousands of German troops soon arrived in Lucy and Suzanne's adopted home to build fortifications, which would be used to protect the continent from Allied assault. So it was important that, uh, it was so important that Hitler personally received regular updates from the island. No dissent could be tolerated in such, such a strategically important location. But dissent is exactly what Lucy and Suzanne did. Back in Paris, they had been involved in left-wing politics, befriending communists and other radicals. They had signed petitions and open letters against the rise of fascism and protect, protesting anti-immigrant legislation. 
Lucy had written a letter to a magazine supporting gay rights. So by the time they arrived on Jersey, they had been rebels for some time. Add to that their own lives as a lesbian cu couple, as lesbian partners lived in opposition to the mores of their day and their provocative artwork that challenged notions of beauty and gender identity. Ultimately, all of the strands of their lives came together, not only to give them the strength to resist the German occupation of Jersey, but to give them the skills to do so. They put their creative talents, their political inclinations, and their personal backgrounds into their work, and it gave them the tools to fight back. Resistance was not an afterthought, but the peak and the point of their creative lives. Most importantly, their love kept them going as they supported one another through what were some very scary and some very stressful moments. I really don't believe that either one of them could have done this work by themselves. I think just like their art, their resistance was something that came out of their relationship and out of their love. Now, as I said before, their desire to resist led them to write notes to the Nazis, something that on the face of it seems small and even inconsequential. But the notes that they wrote were powerful indeed. All of these messages were designed to demoralize the troops or to convince them to desert or to mutiny or to go back to their families in Germany. And the German army took them very seriously. For four years, the secret field police, which was tasked with keeping order in occupied territories, tracked them down, trying to find out who was leaving all these notes around the island. Sometimes the agents would find them on fence posts, sometimes on cafe tables, sometimes the notes were tucked into magazines at the newsstand. Sometimes they were placed inside German staff cars parked along the streets and sometimes even in the soldiers' own pockets. The women even hung a sarcastic banner over the altar at the church near their house where some of the soldiers worshipped, reading, Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater, because Jesus died for people, but people die for Hitler. What they were doing with these messages um, was essentially scaring the German command into believing that a conspiracy was afoot on the island. This strategically important zone about which Hitler received regular updates. Was there some, someone on the island threatening the Atlantic Wall that protected Hitler's conquered continent from Allied attack? The notes only served to stoke German paranoia. Let me read a second excerpt from the book for you. This is the scene where they are arrested. <clears throat> During a quiet dinner, fist pounded at the door the moment Lucy and Suzanne had been expecting every day for nearly four years. The only question was whether the Germans were clever enough to have discovered the women on their own or if someone had ratted them out. Suzanne got up from the table, walked to the door, and pulled it open. Having studied these men carefully from afar for a long time, Lucy and Suzanne knew that they would not be smiling. Five men stood on their doorstep, including the chief of the secret field police, Captain Boda, and a fair-haired man with bright blue eyes who wore mustard-colored plus fours. Suzanne greeted them with a simple good evening. With a surprising graciousness, the fair-haired man clicked his heels and made a deep, respectful bow from the hips. German secret police, Suzanne remembered him announcing politely, we come to search your house. Boda strode to the window seat and made himself comfortable, perhaps, perhaps puffing on his cigar, while the fair-haired man, whom the others called Carl, started to run excitedly back and forth throughout the house. They ransacked every corner, pulling out all the drawers, prying into every nook and cranny of Lucy and Suzanne's lives. From his perch, Boda watched with suspicion as the two tired women, their faces slightly wrinkled and hair graying, stood by. Too late, Lucy announced in English, knowing that these men did not speak French and herself unable to speak much German. Germany has already lost the war, she proclaimed. Lucy and Suzanne remained calm, but their maid, Edna, panicked as the men ravaged the house. She knew everyone in the household had been breaking German regulations by hoarding food. Perhaps she worried that she had let something slip about the illegal radio. Carl came over to Lucy and stared down at her. And what do you think will happen to you? You tell me that, he shouted, his calm and polite demeanor at the door now gone as the adrenaline from the thrill of the chase pumped through him. I think that probably you will torture us and shoot us afterward, Lucy replied flatly, as though she had always known and accepted that this would be the outcome. Carl was stunned silent. These women were not hysterical or even surprised by a raid on their house, but were already anticipating their own deaths. I believe that until that moment, he had thought us unaware of the risks we were taking, Suzanne reflected. Carl looked at Boda, then back at Lucy and Suzanne, but we never do that kind of thing, he proclaimed indignantly. That is BBC propaganda. Lucy glanced back at him, raising her eyebrow in disbelief. 
So the notes that frightened the Germans the most, uh, like the one you see here, were the ones that Lucy and Suzanne signed. But they didn't sign with their own name, but with the name of an author that they invented. They created a fictional persona and pretended to write messages from that perspective in German, since Suzanne was fluent. But that persona was significant. They called him the soldier with no name. In other words, they crossed gender lines once again, this time in effect becoming, so to speak, a German soldier. And when they wrote notes in this male German voice aimed at the other soldiers, they made the secret police believe that the threat was coming from within the German army itself. And this was one of their innovations. Note writing was not unique to them. There are many cases of people living in German occupied territory and even within Nazi Germany itself, writing notes as a form of dissent. But most of those notes were aimed at the civilian population, reminding them to keep their spirits up or calling on them to resist the Nazis. As far as I can tell, Lucy and Suzanne were unique as civilians aiming their notes at the German soldiers themselves. The only real parallel was the Allied PSYOPs campaign, which dropped German language leaflets behind enemy lines, encouraging soldiers to desert or to surrender. What Lucy and Suzanne were doing here was rewriting the inner script or what the political theorist James C. Scott calls the hidden transcript that the Germans told themselves about how the war was going. They were getting inside the minds of the soldiers and sowing seeds of doubt and dissension, spreading ideas that they hoped would go viral, so to speak, as we might say today, uh, among the troops. Someone I was talking with recently actually likened them to sort of internet memes, you know, messages that circulate over and over on the internet. If a German read their notes signed by the soldier with no name and believed that they really were written by a comrade, then Lucy and Suzanne hoped he might think twice about what he was doing on Jersey. Maybe he would mutiny or desert. Now, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, of course, um, here today, but suffice it to say that they were indeed arrested by the secret field police, as we heard in the last excerpt. They were interrogated and they were put on trial on November 16th, 1944, just over 76 years ago. And they were sentenced to prison and then sentenced to death. Um, and I'd like to read a third excerpt from the book. Um, and this is the excerpt that, uh, that talks about their trial. The judges and lawyers convened in large imitation leather armchairs on one side of the table. Lucy and Suzanne's chairs placed opposite the Germans were so large that the women could not use the armrests without spreading themselves unnaturally wide. So Suzanne rested her hands in her lap. Lucy, thinned by illness and lack of nourishment, was curled up in one corner of her chair like a child who climbed in a seat made for a large adult. Behind them were two rows of spindly gilt cane chairs. Captain Boda wearing a white jacket and smoking his cigar balanced on one of them. On a table lay all the items confiscated during the raid, including their Phillips radio, their Underwood typewriter, the Kodak camera, two guns, books, articles published by Lucy's father, one of Suzanne's wooden crosses that Lucy had planted on a soldier's fresh grave, pieces of fabric, and a few of the coins on which the women had painted down with war with nail polish. These once familiar things now seemed strange, so out of context in a courtroom rather than at home. This collection looks like a sort of junk shop, Lucy Riley thought. Also on the table sat Boda's fat file, which was packed with their notes. The approximately 300 scraps of paper now entered into evidence were only a fraction of what they had produced, 1 20th, Lucy claimed. Her estimate was different from what Suzanne recalled, but of course, neither had really been counting. The other noteworthy feature in the room was the three quarter length portrait of Hitler that hung over the fireplace. He appeared to be presiding over the trial. Lucy recalled the large windows of the courtroom filled with the sunshine from the beautiful day outside, even describing the room as hot. What a luxury, she thought, compared with their cold prison cells. Two large comfortable armchairs in the front row next to one another. What a delight, we are at the show, Lucy remembered with more than a bit of sarcasm. The decor, the actors did not disappoint us. Rather than reading the indictment or inviting the prosecutor to begin, the chief judge, Oberst Obstrichter Harmsen, began by questioning Lucy and Suzanne in German about their responses during their interrogations. Then he asked about some of the evidence he felt had been ignored, peppering the women with a string of additional queries. Any previous convictions, Harmsen asked them, have you ever appeared before a court? Never, Suzanne answered in German, speaking for both herself and for Lucy. Harmson turned the proceedings over to the prosecutor, Lieutenant Lung, so that he could make the formal case against the women. And for the next few hours, he did just that. 
Lung began by focusing on several of their leaflets and messages to the German troops. One was a darkly funny version of a heroic song. The interrogator had asked him about it, and Suzanne had not denied that it crudely shamed German women and embarrassed German men. Lung read the song in its entirety to the court. The refrain joked, and when I came home on leave, my wife was pregnant. Don't be cross, my little boy, she said. The fatherland needs soldiers. This is an insult to German womanhood, Harmson declared. One of the other judges, deeply offended, refused to look at Lucy and Suzanne. By no means, Suzanne protested. I've simply tried to show the kind of situation that would arise if a woman actually followed the directives of the party. The men at the table sat silently as Harmson shuffled his papers. Perhaps I should have made it clear that the father of the many children the song went on to mention was always an Aryan, she quipped slyly. Harmson put the leaflet down and picked up another. When it came time to pass sentence, Harmson was blunt. You are franc tireur, he declared, using the French term for guerrilla fighters or irregular military shooters, even though you used spiritual arms instead of firearms. He gave a brief summary on why their actions were so significant and why he had condemned them as dangerous political criminals. It is indeed a more serious crime, he claimed. With firearms, one knows at once what damage has been done, but with spiritual arms, one cannot know, one cannot tell how far reaching it may be. Lucy could not help but think, we couldn't have put our defense any better ourselves. Now, even during their time in prison, um, the women kept up their efforts at defying the Nazis. They befriended guards, they passed notes, they comforted other prisoners in the night. Um, and the book is full of a lot of really, I think, very surprising episodes about what took place in those moments. German guards that were both frightening and humane, prisoners who were keeping one another's spirits up with singing, Lucy and Suzanne smuggling notes to one another, uh, tales of German deserters being hauled off to their execution, leaving Lucy and Suzanne to wonder when their turn before the firing squad would come. But there's one story in particular that stands out because I think it highlights how important their relationship, their love story was to making all of this happen. <laughs> As Lucy was being interrogated by the secret police, she made a stunning admission. She blurted out, I am on my father's side of Jewish origin. She admitted to being an unregistered Jew living in Nazi occupied territory, thereby putting herself in grave danger. Then she confessed to the supposed crime telling her interrogator that she wrote all the notes by herself and that the whole thing was her idea. She was trying to convince her interrogators that she alone had the motive to become the soldier with no name. But in reality, she was not claiming credit for their work as the true mastermind behind their campaign, as some scholars have believed. In fact, Lucy knew just how much of the resistance Suzanne was responsible for. Lucy wrote that it was more often me who accompanied Suzanne she who took the initiative, which required the most sang froid. Instead, what Lucy was doing in this calculated risk in admitting her Jewishness is that she was trying to take the fall and to save Suzanne. If the police believed that Lucy alone had had a motive to write their notes, then the woman she loved might somehow get off. Lucy and Suzanne survived the war, but they had to work hard to make sense of it. What had it all meant? After all, they did not drive the Germans from Jersey with their notes, but in some very important and very personal ways, their effort was a success. And it's something that speaks to us today, I think about the power of creativity and imagination and persistence, especially in trying times. I think they've left us with a story about how even small acts of protest and refusal can have significant effects that are hard to see until later. And I think they remind us why history matters because in the midst of our present day difficulties, a pandemic, deep political polarization, economic uncertainty, we can look back to the stories of people who had it far worse, but still somehow survived. So I wanna close with a final excerpt from the book where I talk about how Lucy and Suzanne tried to make sense of what they had gone through. After the war, one day in saint Helier, Lucy and Suzanne encountered a woman whom they had never met before. She stopped them and proclaimed, I'm so happy to see you alive. Several others also gathered around to greet Lucy and Suzanne. They were in disbelief to learn that the women had survived their ordeal. It must have been a dreadful experience, the woman continued. Now you must forget all about it. Lucy and Suzanne were left dumbfounded by her blithe advice. Later, Lucy sat on her bed, leafing through a stack of papers. Next to her on a small table where she placed her tea tray, 
sat the square hat box one of the German guards had given to her last August as a place to keep her personal items. Other than her memories, the miscellaneous mementos inside this box were all she had left of their months behind bars. Of all our baggage, she said, the hat box was the only one that had any value. She determined that she would organize all the prison communications, letters, drawings, notes between her and Suzanne. Few of the documents from their earlier lives had survived the occupation of their home by Germans. She speculated that the soldiers had used them to light fires in the fireplace. Lucy gave some papers to a friend on Jersey, and she sent a few other items to friends back in Paris, but the ones with their most personal meaning did not leave that box. The memories were too precious. When Lucy couldn't sleep, she reread the notes that Suzanne had written to her during their prison stay, some of them on sanitary napkins, and felt strangely nostalgic. But as the days went on, her thoughts began to darken. Lucy had always been the more pessimistic of the two, prone to depression and suicidal feelings, and her gloomier meditations in the aftermath of the war echoed that part of her personality. She later wrote about how she had become possessed in those days by an overwhelming fear that all her struggles had been for nothing, that there were no greater lessons to learn from all the experiences she had lived through, Suzanne's suicide attempt, their home being plundered, illness, death, in the months after the war, they had even had to put their beloved cat to sleep. Lucy likened herself in her reminiscences to a repeat offender Lazarus, rising from the dead over and over, only to witness still more suffering. Throughout the years that followed, she wrote about the war in lengthy friends, letters to friends, and in early drafts of what might have become a memoir had she lived longer. These writings were not the sort of quest for personal identity that she had composed as a young woman in the 1920s and 1930s, but were rather an attempt to make sense of what the war and their time in prison had meant in broader, more universal terms, despite her underlying fear that there was no such meaning to be made. But there had been a point to what they did. Lucy wrote in a 1950 letter, from July 1940, the invasion of Jersey, until May 1945, the liberation of the Channel Islands, yes, even in prison, even in secret, I wrote to encourage men, including the German soldiers, to liberate themselves. Now, whether such self-liberation took place was easy to doubt, um, but there were some occasional glimpses of something that might offer a larger perspective and a sense, perhaps, of vindication. In 1946, for example, Suzanne received a letter in German from a POW military hospital. It was from Heinrich Ebers, one of the men who had guarded Lucy and Suzanne in prison. Surely German jailers did not typically write to their former inmates. His family was alive and in good health, he reported, and the British were treating him well. He asked Suzanne to greet Lucy and to write him back. In some strange way, perhaps Heinrich, the German guard, had liberated himself and wanted them to know it. Lucy and Suzanne had liberated themselves through their resistance work too. Lucy in particular had struggled with the question of identity her whole life, from her youth in an assimilated Jewish household during the heat of the Dreyfus Affair, to her struggles with her mother's mental illness and her own poor health. Her early writings as Claude Cahoon were inwardly focused, a tortured extended attempt to answer the question, who am I? Which neither her book nor her evolving self-presentation or her numerous aliases or her radical politics could ever seem to resolve. She was always looking for more. Lucy finally found her identity through the soldier with no name and so did Suzanne. The war was the one moment in their lives when they seemed to have the strongest sense of purpose and the most direct vision about who they wanted to be. Against the Nazis, there was a moral clarity and a certainty which their earlier work did not always have. The soldier with no name finally liberated them to speak as loudly and as distinctly as they wanted. So that's the end of my presentation and we can uh, discuss for a few moments and, and I'm happy to answer some questions that you might have. If you want to find out more uh, about me or about the book, you can go to my website, jeffreyhjackson.com. Um, as I said, you can uh, go to Novel as well and pick up a, a signed copy. Um, I'm also available to speak with, uh, with book clubs and other groups and I'm also going to be teaching a class, a four-week discussion um, of this book um, through Rhodes College's Meeman Center for Lifelong Learning. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Meeman Center. Um, and that you can find out more information about that uh, on the Meeman Center's website. I think those are going to be the four, mm, I can't remember which day of the week it is. They're going to be four, <laughs> four, I think, Thursdays in April. 
Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, we just set that up. So if you're interested in having a more, um, a lengthier discussion or conversation about this, uh, there'll be an opportunity um, to do that as well. So let me stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it back over to Sophie to sort of moderate the questions. And um, if anybody wants to, to pose a question, I'll be happy to, to do my best to answer. Thank you so much. I already have one question waiting for us in the chat, which is how you came across this story and why it spoke to you. Um, so I came across the story, um, thanks. I always have to give uh, first thanks to my wife uh, because my wife is an art historian and she taught for many years at the Memphis College of Art, which unfortunately is no longer. But um, she taught, one of the courses that she taught was a course on the history of photography. And so she knew there, the photographs that, that Lucy and Suzanne or Cahoon and Moore had taken. And, and, and these are, they're, as I said, they've become sort of well known uh, for their photography um, in, in more recent years. And so she showed me some of the photographs and she said, you should look at this and <laughs> uh, there might be something interesting here. And she knew a little bit about the, the resistance story, but she didn't know a whole lot because really not a whole lot has been written until this book. There've been a few things here and there, short pieces. Um, and so I, I saw the photographs, looked at them, tried to learn a little bit more about their resistance work, um, couldn't find out much, and, uh, and so wanted to investigate. So, uh, so I, like I said, I, I have to give credit to my wife. I always say, I, I, I always listen to my wife. So uh, since she was the one who said, uh, <laughs> you should take a, take a look at this, I was very glad that, that she did that. So, um, and I think then, you know, once you start looking at the photographs and then of course start reading the notes um, uh, that they were writing, that, that all the whole the whole story um, becomes becomes very inspiring, and as I said, I've had an opportunity to to share it with lots of people um, across the country and even in other countries as well. And it's uh, people really find this to be a, a very compelling story. Wonderful. Another question in the chat is: Why do you think the Nazis refrained from shipping Lucy off to a death camp or from executing her? That's a great question. It's hard to know exactly. Um, at least at the very beginning of their time in prison. Um, part of the issue is that um, it's not too long after they're arrested. Well, it's a few months, I guess, after they're arrested, um, D-Day happens. Um, and so once D-Day happens, then, they're, then the Germans are cut off, essentially. They continue to hold the Channel Islands, but they're cut off from, um, from the rest of, of the continent. But even before that, um, it was becoming harder and harder. So I think a lot of it had to do with logistics. Um, there were also concerns by this point, by the time that they're arrested, it's late in 1944 or mid 1944. Um, they've, already, they've already been losing significant battles in the East. The war is really, the tide has started to turn by this point. And so there's, a, I think it's never really sort of expressly said, but I think there's a concern on the part of the occup occupation forces that if they were to, um, you know, to do any further shipping off of civilians, that they, it might create problems after the war, um, because they already had a sense that this was not going to turn out well. Now, that's not to say that they hadn't already done this. They had already sent a number of people from Jersey to prison camps, and a few of them even to extermination camps. So there were people from Jersey who died in the Holocaust and who spent time, either died in prison camps or um, or spent uh, many, many months uh, uh, during the war there. But I think by the time that they were arrested, there was a logistical, just logistical problems. But Lucy and Suzanne didn't know that. And so they spent their entire eight months in prison basically thinking that every day was going to be the day um, that they would die. I mean, Lucy was very, very clear about that. And as I said at the end there, she was the more pessimistic anyway. But it was very clear that she anticipated that you know that they neither of them expected to survive the war. Neither of them thought that they would that they would live, um, one way or the other, that something would happen. Um, and so, the, you know, the prison experience, and as I talk about this more in the book, the prison experience was not what you would expect from a German prison. There was not sort of this kind of intense violence. There were not beatings. There were not you know sort of violent scenes. But there was very much a kind of psychological violence that they suffered through all those months, precisely because they did not know what was gonna to happen to them. Um, and so the fact that the Germans were having these logistical problems and sending them and other prisoners to the continent 
meant that they were essentially living in an information vacuum. They just didn't know what was going to happen. And so that, that really made them um, worry for that all that time. Was, Mary, go for it. Was there any evidence that their acts were uh, bore fruit, so to speak? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, I, to me, they're, the best example that their, that their acts were meaningful is that they were pursued for four years. So I, don't, I don't think that the, the secret field police would have hunted them for four years had they not felt that this was really a significant threat to the German control of the island. Um, and so, um, in other words, this was not something that the Germans felt like, oh, we can just ignore this, or this is just some silly local thing. I mean, it was really, um, it had a significance to the, to the secret police and to the German command. They did in prison end up meeting a few men who had, uh, had, who had encountered some of their notes. So there was uh, a little bit of evidence there, and one in particular that they had a conversation with. Um, that, uh, so that they knew that there were people who were actually encountering these notes and reading them. Um, but of course they couldn't go up and ask soldiers. <laughs> they couldn't, uh, you know, have, you know, other than in prison, they couldn't just sort of go up and talk to people and say, hey, what did you think of my note? Um, because they obviously couldn't expose themselves in that way. So it was interesting that for most of the war, really, they were operating in kind of a vacuum, um, putting these notes out there, not really knowing whether they were going to have an impact or not. So, um, so the evidence is, you know, it, it's sparse just because of that situation. Um, but, but there were definitely at least a few people that they were able to encounter that, that, that they had a sense that the notes, you know, were, were resonating for sure. Great question. Anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Either take yourself off mute and ask, or you can type it in the chat. Yeah, Barbara. Well, this is not a question. I just want to say, I loved your book. It was so much fun to read. It was about interesting people and an interesting time and so well done. Thank you for doing it. Well, I really appreciate that. It's, it's always nice to hear, you know, you write a book. I, somebody asked me how long did this book take to, for me to write? And I went back in my notes on my computer and I realized that it took me about seven years um, to do this finish. And so you, you spend all that time doing it and you put it out there in the world and you, all you can really do is kind of like Lucy and Suzanne, you hope people are reading it. <laughs> you don't know yeah. if they are. So I always very deeply appreciate comments uh, like that and, and uh, know that not only people are reading it, but also enjoying it. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for sharing that comment with me. I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing your what must have been an incredible amount of research time and organizing and writing. So thank was, you for that. It, Thank you. It was very much like putting a puzzle. I mean, all research, all historical research is like putting a puzzle together. Um, this one probably more so for all sorts of reasons, um, having to do with the condition of the, of the material in the archive spread out on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it, it was probably the most complicated research project that I've ever done. Um, but it, 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 was good, it was a good project. I, I learned a lot. From it. I thought I saw a question pop up in the chat. Am I right? Yes, yeah, there's one other question. It's where, well, were there any other underground anti-German activities on Jersey? There were a number of other uh, people on Jersey who were engaged in, uh, in resistance activity. Um, what's interesting about Jersey and the other Channel Islands is that, uh, and I don't talk about the other islands in the book, there's seven islands that are part of the Channel Islands. I only talk about Jersey because that's where Lucy and Suzanne were, but um, on both Jersey and Guernsey, which is the other major island, um, there were resistance activities, but they were not really coordinated in any way. You know, often we talk about resistance in the war, we think about maybe the French resistance, right? And either that um, or, in, or partisans in Yugoslavia or other places, sometimes that resistance was coordinated locally. Sometimes, like in the French case, it was also, there was, you know, Charles de Gaulle in London who was issuing orders, sort of a top-down organization. On the islands though, there was no opportunity for any of the local people on those islands to talk to any of those other groups. So they couldn't connect to any other resistance movements outside the island. And even on the island itself, they were not really working with one another, largely because there were so many Germans on the island. I mean, this is a, the, Jersey is, a, I think I say in the book, it's about 45 square miles. So this is not a large island. Um, 
And there were thousands of German troops there, um, as well as slave laborers you know, building this Atlantic wall, the Atlantic wall of these fortifications that were part of this, uh, of this structure. So um, the ability to sort of work with one another really wasn't there, um, or not in any formal way. There might've been informal things. There were cases though of, of families that worked together. And in fact, Lucy and Suzanne met in, pr in prison, met families. Um, who were arrested, you know, multiple members of the same family spending time in prison because they had been arrested because they were all, you know, together as a family engaged in some kind of resistance activity, maybe hoarding or sabotage. Some of them were trying to leave the islands, trying to sneak off in boats. That was forbidden because the concern there was that maybe they were going to sneak, sneak off to, um, to Britain um, or to find allied soldiers and to, you know, tell what was going on on the island. So, um, so there were plenty of other uh, activities, small scale local activities by other individuals, but, but very few of them really had any kind of coordination. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? The question I had, I was really struck by the fact that they seemed to move between artistic media, that they didn't um, stick to just one form of art in their resistance and in their work. And so I'm curious um, what sort of formal art training or education they had or lack thereof, and maybe how that contributed to their flu artistic fluidity. Right. That's a great question. Um, Suzanne had training, formal training in art school uh, in Nantes when she was young. So she had studied illustration um, and some other, I forget exactly, but illustration was sort of her main thing. And, and her time in Paris, she was, she became an illustrator and, and made, you know, uh, worked as an illustrator. Lucy really was primarily a writer. Um, that's her main, that was her main uh, creative work. But from early on, the two of them had collaborated on photography. And so that's what nowadays, like I said, if you were to search on the internet for Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore or Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Miller, you would find the photos much more easily than you would find any other writing or any of Suzanne's drawings. That's what they've become sort of rediscovered for. So, so Suzanne had the visual arts training and illustration. Lucy had experience as a writer. Together they worked on photography. And then I think also being part of that artist, artistic milieu of Paris in the 1920s, they were meeting people, you know, at a time when the avant-garde in Paris was really sort of pushing those boundaries and you know, thinking about collage and multimedia and doing, you know, kind of early, what we would think of as multimedia, um, you know, early kind of work in that. So I think that they learned a lot from the other people they were with in Paris. They learned a lot from their collaboration with one another. And I think all of that kind of came together then um, in this work. Um, even the idea of leaving notes actually is something that um, I trace in the book, a kind of a, a one of the ins in, uh, inspirations for that was something that surrealist artists in Paris were doing. Um, the surrealists had this thing they called, they called them butterflies. And what they were were little notes that they would leave around Paris with these sort of shocking slogans or funny statements. And the, the goal was, you know, to kind of shock people, right, at, into some different way of thinking. So I think Lucy and Suzanne took that idea along with other ideas that they had learned from, from the Paris days and it all kind of merged um, into this sort of perfect moment when they could bring all of those skill sets, the writing, the visual art, you know, everything together. And they did even incorporate some of their photography too. Um, they would, or they would take photographs out of magazines and cut them up and do photo montage, which they had done back in Paris. So, um, so I think that fluidity was definitely built into their work together um, and to the art scene. Wonderful, thank you. We probably have time for a couple, couple more questions if anyone has them. Or any final comments maybe from you, Professor Jackson, about, about the topic, about the artists, anything, any words of wisdom or insights you want to leave with us before we close out? Um, well, I, I mean, first of all, just again, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's so great to, to speak to folks and in particular here in Memphis. Um, <clears throat> and um, I really uh, appreciate that. And um, I know that uh, a, um, a couple of you have read the book and, and uh, it's been great to, to talk to you. And as I said, if you wanna talk more, we can do so in other, in other venues. I think one thing about this book is that, you know, I've, this presentation was about a half an hour. It's so, I, as I'm doing the presentation, I think to myself how much I'm leaving out, <laughs> how much this story is a complicated story. Um, because in some ways this really is, even though the story is focused on 
the, the wartime experience, it really is a story of two lives and there's a kind of connection, there's a line there that you see the young women that they start out as creating the context for what they will end up doing later. And I think it's, you know, it says something about how, um, you know, over the course of a lifetime, it, sometimes you can't see those continuities. The historian has the ability to look back and see those continuities. Um, we don't always have that ability in our own life. <clears throat> Often that, that nevertheless, there are those continuities. Um, in our lives that, that shape who we are now when we, when we can look back. And so, um, you know, being able to do that for these other people, for people who are, you know, really living these amazing um, lives, because even if you, even if they had not been involved in the war at all, their lives would be amazing, right? Because of the, the time that they spent in Paris doing what they did. Um, and so to really put it all together, sort of this kind of young life in Paris and this older life um, on Jersey and kind of what came of it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's remarkable to me that they haven't been talked about more. Um, and so I'm really honored to be able to, to really tell their story and share their story with, with folks who wanna hear more about it. Amazing, and thank you so much for bringing the conversation to us and including us in this conversation. I'm really thrilled that we get to hear from you and learn from you and excited uh, for this book to be reaching more people. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom. It's been such a pleasure. Um, and I'll make sure to follow up with everyone with links to Professor Jackson's website and information on where to find the book again. Um, and I will, before we close out, I will give one plug about our next lecture um, in our lecture series, which will be on Friday, February 5th. So two weeks from today, also at noon, right here on Zoom. Um, the next lecture will feature Professor Samantha Alprin, who is the Chair of Education at Christian Brothers University, and who will discuss college students and if they will be prepared to enter the workforce today after spending time learning in COVID times. So that should be a very interesting conversation. Um, and otherwise, thank you again, Professor Jackson, for kicking us off, kicking our lecture series off for this semester. Um, it's been fantastic to learn from you today. Thank Thanks you. so much. I appreciate it. Thank you everyone for joining the call and we'll see you soon. Sophie. Bye. Sophie. Yes. You have accomplished something Aww. that has never been done before. Aww. That is making Jewish faculty visible. Mm. Something that was very important and you've done it in a beautiful way. Aww, thank you. I'm glad that you feel that way. I, to me, it's an important, important aspect of our work to emphasize and there's no better time to do it than now, especially with technology that allows us to bring more people together. So thank you so much. That means a lot. If thank not you. now, <clears throat> if not now, when? Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Thanks everyone. Stay thank safe. You. Bye.